Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret, and we are in the series, The Gospel According to Moses in the book of Exodus, and we're in Lesson 35. We're going to focus in on Exodus chapter 12, and we're not going to move very far from Lesson 34. We're going to be in verses 14 through 16 of Exodus 12. Reading from the New American Standard, Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses, for whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall have a holy assembly, and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them, except what must be done. What 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 must be done to eat uh, on them, except what must be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. So, in my study and my research, as I was looking at not only from verse 14 but through all the way through the end of the chapter to verse 51 i was deeply affected by a comment made by dennis prager you if you have listened to these podcasts both in genesis and in exodus you know that dennis prager is a resource that i use because of his expertise his knowledge knowledge of hebrew um, he has taught Torah verse by verse, word by word for 25 years. And he made a comment in his audio sessions on these verses. It's not in this book. You will not find this in the Rational Bible Exodus, but his audio Torah commentary. Now his book that he wrote, that one and Genesis and the one Deuteronomy, which is coming out uh, later on this year, they're based upon these audio sessions that took 25 years to complete. Now his comment is related to the number seven. Here we talk about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread will last seven days. Now on top of that, if you recall, if you have listened to the previous lessons, 22, 23, uh, um, 32, 33, and 34, we talked about Exodus 12, verses 1 through 2, and it's God's new year. On top of that, that this is a new year. It's a new beginning. And indeed, out of all of this comes a new nation, Israel, and a new beginning. In Isaiah 42, 6 and 49, 6, it talks about Israel as being a light to the nations to bring the salvation of God to the ends of the earth. Now, for Christians, you may say, wait a minute, that sounds like something that Jesus said in Acts chapter 1. Yes, Jesus is relating it to Isaiah 42, 6 and 49, 6. And this reminds us of the seven days of creation. And this is where Dennis Prager was going to with this. Just as creation was a new beginning, a new world, new people, Adam and Eve, so too now the Exodus is a new beginning for the descendants of Abraham. It's a new world. A new world in the sense that soon there will be a nation of Israel with boundaries. A new people. So in Prager's audio, on his Torah commentary, it's actually volume two in the Exodus series, folder four, and audio selection number three. And he makes a statement on the audio that he thinks it's very problematic that the Orthodox Jewish rabbis changed God's word. And they made the Feast of Unleavened Bread last eight days. For Dennis Prager, who is a deeply devout religious Jew, he felt that this was a major error done by the rabbis. I concur. 
it defeats the purpose of the number seven as related to the feast. Matter of fact, as Dennis goes on, it defeats the understanding of the amazing use of number seven throughout the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. <laughs> and he said he felt that this audio session would probably never be uh, played in an Orthodox school or uh, an Orthodox synagogue only for the simple reason that here's Dennis practicing Judaism but disagreeing with the rabbis. So, he says, clearly Exodus seems to be connected to creation because of the number seven. Now, seven, we all have to agree, is a special biblical number. Now, it's a number that some say represents God, uh, represents holiness, it represents his hand, his awesomeness. Seven represents creation or completeness or perfection, but here's the key. The Bible never says that. The Bible is totally silent. These so-called Christian scholars, including myself, they are stating their opinion. Seven is the number of perfection. The Bible doesn't say that. Seven is the number of completeness. The Bible doesn't say that. They're stating their opinion. I wish they, like the rabbis, Orthodox rabbis, would have stated things like, seven seems to be related to uh, perfection. Seven seems to be related to completeness. But they say, no, it is. There's no Bible backup for their comments. Let's take a look at an article from a place called BibleStudy.org in terms of this unbelievable use of seven in the Bible. It's used 735 times, 54 times in the book of Revelation alone. The number seven is the foundation of God's word. If we include with this count how many times sevenfold or seventh is used, our jump comes up to 860 references. Now, again, here's where this scholar who's writing this article, they make this statement. Seven is the number of completeness and perfection, both physical and spiritual. No, it does not say that in the Bible. I believe this scholar should change the sentence because they're acting just like Orthodox rabbis. When rabbis make up a midrash, when they tried to do a midrash, a... a uh, a filling in of an unanswered question in the Torah and they make up their own stuff? Here, this scholar says seven is the number of completeness. I believe the question, the at statement should be seven is like the number of completeness. It's like the number of per perfection. Goes on to say it derives much of its meaning from being tied directly to God's creation of all things. According to some Jewish traditions, the creation of Adam was on the first day of Tishri or the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. Now the word created is used seven times describing God's creative work in Genesis 1 1, verse 21, 27 three times, in verse 2, chapter 2, verse 3, and verse 4. There are seven days in a week, and God's Sabbath is on the seventh day. <laughs> on top of that, Jericho was defeated after seven days of marching around the city. So this article goes on to say, the Bible as a whole was originally, now listen to this, the Bible as a whole was originally divided into seven major divisions. They were the Torah, the prophets, the writings, the gospels and acts, the general epistles, the epistles of Paul, and the book of Revelation. The total number of original inspired books was 49, seven times seven demonstrating the absolute perfection of the Word of God. Now, you're going to say, wait a minute, we have 66 books of the Bible. And I know, I know, we have been taught that, but the order, 66 books in the Bible, comes from Jerome. 
382 to 405 AD. He changed the order. He changed the order of the Hebrew scriptures. At the time Jerome changed the order of the books in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, the Jews had 22. Jerome changed it to 39. The original order of the books in the Hebrew scriptures, you know there are 12 minor prophets. Well, the Jews had one book called the 12 prophets. So they include included all 12 minor prophets in one book. And the book um, and first and second Samuel and first and second Kings was called the book of the kingdom combined in the one book. <laughs> so in Jesus' day, the Old Testament only had 22 books. Josephus even talks about this in his own writings, that the entire Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures, was on 22 scrolls. Now you combine that with the New Testament, and we come up with 49. Seven times seven. The number seven, again, used as related to to the number of books in the Bible. This is just amazing. Now, I want you to note that I'm going to be quoting a number of articles in here, reading from them extensively in some cases. I have linked you to these articles on the website. Remember, the website is www.lightofmenorah, all one word, dot org. Remember, menorah is spelled M-E-N-O-R-A-H. Now, some of you may not go to the website. Some of you may be on, on a um, um, an app. You listen to us on an app. Uh, so iHeartRadio uh, is an app that plays our pod- podcasts. Uh, YouTube actually does that. So if you're using an app, as you come to this audio session you should see an indication on your app to click on to see more or to show more or to uh, access more of the description of the session. And if you click on that, especially if you're using Podbean, you'll be able to get that full description and these links on your phone, uh, on your iPad, um, on your Android pad, or, or on your computer as well. And thereby you'll be able to get these links. And so I've linked you to this article, which again was from BibleStudy.org on the meaning of the numbers of the Bible, like number seven. Now, this seven, you guys, we know this. The Jewish scholars even say this goes on and on. Seven, it shows seemingly shows the hand of God in the Hebrew scriptures. A great Torah scholar, Umberto Casuto, he said, with the amazing use of seven, it cannot be done by random chance. This is no coincidence. Hebrew scriptures are designed by God, and the number seven seems to show that design. So, agreed? Yes, the Bible is inspired by God. Now, for us today, we have 66 books, 49 in, uh, 49 in Jesus' day, if we include all the books of the New Testament. 40 writers of the entire Bible over 1,500 years. So, if we go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we read, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. It's inspired by God. It's not written by God. This is not God's written word. It is God's inspired word. We go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21, and we read, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. 
And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy, no scripture, was ever made by an act of human will, but by men moved by the Holy Spirit who spoke from God. It is as if the seven is God's watermark. Now what I mean by watermark is when I do videos, and even when I'm doing these podcasts, I look for pictures. Pictures that I actually can use in the introduction of each session. If you actually took a look at the picture at the website for this session, session 35 in Exodus, you'll see a kind of a cool picture with the number seven in blue and a number of other sevens shadowed in the background. Now many times I'll go to websites where I can get these photos but I have to pay a price. If I don't pay a price and I download them, they'll have a watermark on there. In other words, you'll see a picture and there'll be some sort of, um, let's make believe, like um, uh, Pixabay. Pixabay is basically free. But Pixabay might have Pixabay in a light gray printing on the picture when you would actually save it. But if you actually paid for it, that watermark, that light printing of the name of the actual website where you're getting at would be erased. So seven is like God's watermark. His watermark of his inspired word. So in other words, if you find a seven or a pattern of sevens, you might be saying, I'm dealing with God's real word. Now here's two amazing examples from Genesis. Again, I'm going to be linking you to this article from Dr. Elaine Goodfriend, a fabulous scholar in the southern part of the United States. This is from thetorah.com. And she talks about the use of the number seven in the creation account. So in her article, she says in Genesis 1.1, it contains seven words and 28 letters. 28 is divisible by seven. Verse 2, the description of the primal chaos is described in 14 words, 2 times 7. The word Elohim, God, is found 35 times in Genesis 1-1 to Genesis 2-3, the entire account of the creation. God's, the word God, Elohim, is there 35 times, 5 times 7. The term land, edits, appears 21 times in the passage, 3 times 7. And so together do the terms firmament and heavens in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4. The root for animal or living being is used seven times on days five and six of creation. So are the verbal nominal forms of the roots for bird and flying as well of creeping things or creep. The seventh day, the focus on of Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 has 35 words. Verses 1 through the first part of 3 has have three clauses and each of these clauses has seven words. And the words seventh day are in the center of each clause. The word good, tov, also occurs seven times. The last occurrence in verse 31. Now this is one of the strongest examples of the implicit use of seven. According to, again, Umberto Cossuto, as we mentioned, he talked about, and his quote is, it is impossible to suppose that all of this is coincidental. (laughs) But you guys, it goes deeper than this. From a website called Different Spirit, they go into a further detailed view of Genesis 1, verse 1. 
This is amazing. Get this. We know the verse says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But we got to focus in on Hebrew. In Hebrew it says, Breshit bara Elohim et hashamayim uva eretz. Now, in Hebrew, there are seven words in the verse. Seven Hebrew words. In the verse, there are 28 letters. Huh. Four times seven. The first three words have 14 letters. Two times seven. The last four words have 14 letters. Two times seven. The fourth and fifth words have seven letters. The sixth and seventh words have seven letters. The key words, God, heaven, and earth, have 14 letters, two times seven. The remaining words have 14 letters, two times seven. Now, in Hebrew, way before they got counting, they assigned values to each of their letters. This is critical. Each letter represents a value. I won't go through that right now. You can actually look this up on the internet. You can actually take a look at the Hebrew alphabet numeric values. So there are there's the numeric value, the numeric value of three important nouns: God, heaven, and earth. The numeric value 777. The word created has a numeric value. Like I said, when you actually take a look at the Hebrew word, the letters of the Hebrew word, each letter has a value, has a numeric, a numeric assigned to it. So when you actually add up the letters in the word created, it comes out to 203, which is divisible by 7. The first and last letters of all seven words in Genesis 1.1 the first and last letters of all seven words, when you add it up, comes out to 1,393. It's divisible by seven. The first and last letters of the first and last words, their numeric value is 497. It's divisible by seven. Guys, this is crazy. These patterns of seven, they're all over the Hebrew scriptures. Now, one thing I want to mention is that this is not numerology. Numerology is the symbolic use of a number, especially in the occult, for predicting the future or some other meaning. The Torah is silent on the number seven. God does not tell us what it symbolizes. This is not numerology. But the patterns of it are there and they're unique. There's no other book that has this. No other genre of ancient literature that has this. this these are amazing patterns. And on top of that, this is not Bible codes. Some of you may be into Bible codes. I'm not. I'm quoting from an article from a great website, which I like to access a lot. They have very reasonable commentary on the Bible, both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament. It's called Got Questions, gotquestions.org. And with regards to Bible codes, from the article, it says, Bible codes are hidden messages purported to exist in the original text of Scripture. Now, there do appear to be some Bible codes that reveal specific meaningful information. We cannot completely rule out the possibility that God has done this, has put in hidden messages in His Word. But there's some problems with the idea of Bible codes. Number one, the Bible doesn't ever hint of their existence. So all Bible codes are the result of human constructs overlaid on the text. 
Jesus, in all the times that he cites Bible passages, never once uses a Bible code to draw out a meeting. Paul does the same thing. Never refers to a Bible code. Number two, Bible codes are not necessary. What we need to know and apply is clear enough from straight reading of the scripture. Romans 10, verses 9 through 17. As we grow in Christ, we feed upon his word. As we read in Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. Psalm 105, verse 2. And we already read this. Timothy 3, 16 through 17. And 1 Peter 2, verse 2. All these passages refer to taking the text of the Bible at face value and applying its principles, not dependent on seeking out Bible codes. Number three, identifying Bible codes is somewhat arbitrary. The discovery and interpretation depends greatly on the perspective of the researcher. This is especially true if you're getting into predictions of the future. Yes, surely, it is possible that God embedded some hidden messages in the original text. Sure, and it's possible. But again, a plain reading of the Bible speaks for itself. All we need from the Bible is obtained from a straightforward study of the text. So I too find Bible codes very problematic. Seven is not a code. It does not have a unique meaning. It's, it's like the number seven is God's trademark. I said before, it's like a watermark. Well, it's like it's also like it's trademark. It shows that it's his word. His hand is operational. This was written by men. Yes. Written by men, inspired by God. Yes. And God seems to put these patterns of seven in it to seemingly put on his stamp of approval. Now the rabbis clearly saw this. They clearly saw the stamp of approval by God everywhere. Matter of fact, from Rabbi Hillel ben David, he talks about Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, Actually, he's known by Nachmanides in Greek. And he was alive 1194 to 1270 AD. From his own writings, he says, The first day of creation, which saw the creation of light, embodies the first millennium of history. The first thousand years of history. It's called the thousand years or the millennium of Adam, whom the Midrash... Tanhuma calls the light of the world when the world was still saturated with knowledge of its creator and was sustained by the indiscriminate benevolence of God. The second day on which the creator distinguished between the spiritual and physical elements of his creation yielded the second millennium of history. The next thousand years of history of judgment and discrimination as reflected in the flood which wiped out a corrupt humanity and spared only the righteous Noah and his family. Now it goes on. He says the third day of creation is the day of Abraham. The day, day four, is the fourth day of, his, of the fourth millennium of history. The first 4,000 years of history, it's the first and second temple. Day number five of creation represents the dark ages after the second temple was destroyed until 1240 AD. Day six which is the first 6,000 years of creation from Nachmanides' point of view, is the days of Messiah. Now, Nachmanides is basically saying that Messiah will rule starting in the year 6,000 to the year 7,000. And then day 7, which represents the 7th millennium, is the world to come. Olam Haba. Nachmanides goes on to say, seven is all over the Bible. This is God's hand. We can see it everywhere. And it's in the natural world. It's in God's creation. There's seven days in a week. There's seven notes in a musical scale. There's seven directions. I love this. There's left. There's right. 
There's up. There's down. There's front. There's back. That's six. <laughs> but then there's the center. The center of everything. Left, right, up, down, front, back, and the center. And one that I also really like, there are seven colors in the rainbow. The covenant that God made with Noah and the earth after the flood. Really just quite amazing. So indeed, I can see Dennis Prager's concern. The Orthodox changed the Feast of Unleavened Bread from seven to eight days. How dare they? They do this so much. In Genesis, we're dealing with Isaac, and he got married to Rebecca, and it talks about he prayed for Rebecca for 20 years. But what did the rabbis say? That Isaac and Rebecca were on the roof of their home, and Isaac was in one corner of the roof, and Rebecca was in the other corner. And they did this for 20 years. That's not there. It's not in the Bible. This is the midrash of the rabbis. That's just a small example. I think it's cute. But that's not what the Bible says. So how dare the rabbis, the Orthodox rabbis, change it? It's a glaring error and degrades the significance of the number seven God's trademark or its watermark. But God's use of the number seven, you guys, is not just in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament as well, and we know that. God's trademark shows that the New Testament books is the word of God because this trademark, this watermark, continues. Here's a few examples. Just a few. I mean, you guys, this podcast, I cannot com do a complete job on the number seven. There's just no way. So I'm giving you these links to begin your further study if you wanted to go deeper. And remember... This is not numerology. Remember, this is not Bible codes. I'm not going down there. I, I can't deal with Bible codes. I can't deal with numerology. I want to really teach, like Dennis would say, the rational Bible and put the Bible in biblical history. So when we take a look at the New Testament, we talk about seven loaves of bread Jesus multiplied the seven loaves and it resulted in seven baskets. That's in Matthew 15, starting in verse 32. There's seven demons, demons driven out of Mary Magdalene. Luke chapter 8, verse 2. There are, and I, this is something new. I didn't know this. The seven last sayings of Jesus on the cross. Luke 23, 34 is number one. Luke 23, 34 is number two. Uh, 23, 43. And Luke 23, 46. Those are the first three. Then John 19, 26 through 27. John 19, 28. John 19, verse 30. And the final one that we'll talk about is Matthew 27, verse 46. Book of Revelation, seven seals. In the, in the book of Revelation, seven churches. The seven spirits of God, which is interesting because that's connected to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. The seven spirits of God is in Isaiah. Seven gifts of the Spirit. Now, in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament, there is a phrase, and it's only used seven times. This is just so cool. The phrase is, in Hebrew, anihu, in the Masoretic text, and anihu in Hebrew means I am he. It's only used by God to reference himself. I am he. And it's only used seven times. Here are the seven times that you can find it. Isaiah 41, verse 4. Isaiah 43, verse 10. Isaiah 43, verse 13. Isaiah 46, verse 4. Isaiah 48, verse 12. Isaiah 52, verse 6. 
in Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. So, for instance, let me go to Isaiah 41, verse 4, in English. Who has performed and accomplished it? Calling forth the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, am the first. And with the last, I am he. Ani who? And let's just take a look at Isaiah 52, 6. In 52, 6, we read, Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, I am the one who is speaking. Now, in the New American Standard, it says, says, Here I am. No, it doesn't say that. That is a terrible mistranslation. I am the one who is speaking. Ani who? I am he. Seven times, and only seven times, the phrase Ani who is used. Now, if you went to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the, or the Greek translation of the Old Testament, Ani who is translated into Greek as Ego Emi. Ego Emi means I am he. When you go into the Gospel of John, Ego Emi, Ani who, appears only seven times in John's Gospel. And it only is used by Jesus to refer to himself. Did John know this? Did John know of the use of seven phrases, ani who, in the Hebrew scriptures? And now he's replicating the pattern of seven in his gospel? Maybe. It'd be pretty cool. God inspiring John with the pattern of seven? And therefore saying that Jesus is God. That's what's going on here. But what if John was unaware? That's even more powerful. You guys, these seven, these are not accidents. This is not a random coincidence. Now let me take you to the first book of what I call the Messianic writings. I like the term messianic writings for the new testament the first book of the new testament the messianic writings is matthew now we remember in the first book of the hebrew scriptures genesis chapter one we found those amazing use of sevens in the creation now here we're going to take a look at matthew chapter one verses one through seventeen on the genealogy of jesus now, I remember I would, we, my, Rob, my Robin and I were in Israel with an unbelievable Bible teacher, Ray Vanderland, and I remember him talking about the patterns of seven in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17 in the Greek, not in English. You're not going to see this in English. I didn't get it then. And here we're going to see the trademark of the Lord. Now I want to thank Chuck Missler of Koinonia House. He did an excellent presentation on this Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 through 17. I want to kind of approach it his way. And I will link you to his video by the way. So indeed, whether you go to the website in the description of the session or whether you're on an app and you'll be able to click on to see more of the introductory comments that I have, you should be able to see those links and be able to get them and actually see Chuck Missler's video. He does a great video on this. And basically, he approaches it this way. What if you were asked to write a fictitious genealogy? So make up a genealogy but it had to follow some rules now here are the rules that it has that you have to follow so when you're writing your genealogy the number of words used must be divisible by seven so you could use seven words 14 28 35 42 does that sound pretty easy if you have to follow that rule write a fictitious genealogy make it up 
but the number of words used has to be divisible by seven. Okay? Let's give you a second rule. The number of total letters that you use in the words must be divisible by seven. The number of vowels in all the words you use must be divisible by, by seven. The number of consonants used in the number of words that you used must be divisible by seven. Now, to make matters worse, the number of words with the first letter as a vowel must be divisible by seven, and the number of words that you're using in your fictitious genealogy with the first letter as a consonant must be divisible by seven. So, so far, if you had one rule, it's not too bad. The rules that we have here, this is getting a little bit more complex. You may want to give up at this point. But let's add some more rules. Words that occur more than once in your genealogy must be divisible by seven. And words that occur in more than one form must be divisible by seven. And words that are in only one form must be divisible by seven. So in other words, a word might have several forms. It might have a plural form. It might be a verb with several forms. You ready to try to do this? This, this is getting complex. I have to say right now with all the rules that we've got so far, we could never do this. But let's spice it up some more. The number of nouns in your fictitious genealogy must be divisible by seven. Only seven words cannot be nouns. Only seven. The number of names must be divisible by seven. Only seven other kinds of nouns may be allowed. Seven. The number of male names must be divisible by seven. The number of generations must be divisible by seven. You'd say this is impossible, right? This can't be done. Ladies and gentlemen, all of these rules are found in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. It is the most amazing patterns of seven ever. It's like the crazy patterns of seven in Genesis 1 1, or the sevens that appear in Genesis 1 1 to Genesis 2 3. Now, one scholar said there are people who consider all of this random chance just happened that way. Now, one scholar said, consider this to show how silly this idea of random chance is. Everybody knows that one followed by six zeros means a million. One followed by nine zeros is a billion. One followed by a hundred zeros is called a Google. Now, one Google, how could we describe it? It's the time for a bird to peck at a diamond once a day. It's time for a, 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 a bird to peck at a diamond once a day, and this diamond as big and is, is as big as Mount Everest. And it's the time it takes for that bird to peck at that diamond once a day to bring that diamond down to sea level. The probability that this pattern in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, is one chance in a Google. Now, amazingly, all of this comes from the proven work of one man. His name is Ivan Nikolaevich Panin. He is called the father of Bible numerics. Now notice the word numerics, not numerology. Panin is not talking about numerology or Bible codes. He was born in Russia in 1855, died in the United States in 19...
42. You can look this up on the internet. His name is Ivan Panin, P-A-N-I-N. And the best way to do it is Ivan Panin, father of Bible numerics. And if you Google that, you'll be able to get some great articles. Now, Ivan, as a young man, he participated in a movement to educate the underclasses in the concept called nihilism. And the members of his movement were called themselves the revolutionaries, and the Tsar did not like this. So the Tsar kicked him out of Russia. So at age 18, he went to Germany. He was there for about three years, and at age 22, he immigrates to the United States and, and enters Harvard University. There he spent four years, and this is really crazy, learning Greek and Hebrew. And he graduated in 1882 with a master's in literary criticism. And he traveled around the United States, and he gave lectures on Russian literature, especially Pushkin, Gogol, Turgenev, and Tolstoy. And again, these are those authors contributing to the social upheaval that forced changes in Russia. And he was a firm agnostic. But then something happened. Ivan Panin, in his study of the Bible, he saw there was a system of mathematical relationships underlying the text. He saw the patterns of seven. He was so overwhelmed he became a Christian because he couldn't believe the truth of Scripture based upon that structure. He attested to this to a publication in 1891 called The Structure of the Bible, a proof of the verbal inspiration of Scripture. Now, from his point of view, he said, if these patterns were implemented intentionally, two things must hold true. If these things were done intentionally, that means the 40 writers who wrote the Bible over 1,500 years had to come together in a meeting and collaborate. In other words, they had to all talk about this together and agree that they would do this. Number two, they had to be mathematicians of the highest order. So until his death of 1942, he devoted 50 years of his life to exploring the numerical structures of scriptures. He had 43,000 hand-penned pages of analysis. Just amazing, unbelievable. And like I said, this is not numerology. This is not Bible codes. This is fact. Patterns are there in all reality, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, verse 21, from the first verse to the last verse. So again, we return to Exodus 12, verses 14 through 16. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall have a holy assembly, and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them, except what must be eaten by every person, that alone may be prepared by you. Seven days of unleavened bread. Seven days to remember the Lord's Pesah. Now remember in previous sessions, the Lord's Pesah means the Lord's protection, the Lord's sheltering. And now we see the stamp of approval by God himself on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, his watermark, his trademark. we get an awesome understanding that when we come across seven or the patterns of seven in God's word this is a big deal 
And this is the hand of God, not the hand of men. Now here's a fitting way I want to end this lesson. What's the seventh letter in the Hebrew alphabet? The Hebrew, the seventh letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Zayin. It looks like a T. It has the center post, you might say, vertical post, and then it has kind of a curvy top to it. Not just straight top, like we know in the letter T, but a curvy top. Now, in Jewish tradition, the rabbis made up some teachings with regards to the letter. I think these are great. And I wanted to end with these, this tradition and another one. The letter Zayin, the seventh letter, the rabbis say is a Vav, which is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The Zayin is a Vav with a crown. In other words, it's a crown man. Because if we go to Vav, which is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, they said that represents a man. Zayin represents a crowned man. A crowned man. But on top of that, in the teachings about the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, they said the Zayin also re represents a sword. And we remember Jesus in the book of Revelation. As this, he's a crowned man with the sword of his power coming out of his mouth. The Zayin. It's as if it re represents Jesus himself. Another interesting structure in the scripture. We remember John 3.16. Jesus says, all scripture testifies of me. Now, I definitely believe that Jesus means the Hebrew scriptures because he says it sometime between 24 to 30 AD. But I also believe, as God, he means the rest of the scripture as well, which we call, and I call the Messianic writings, which we call the New Testament. So the first letter in the complete Bible is bet, breishit. The last letter in the book of Revelation is the Greek letter nu, or n. Nu is associated with the Hebrew letter nun, n. So the first letter of the Bible, in Genesis 1-1, is bet. The last letter in the Bible, which is the Greek letter nu, but is also nun. It spells, when we put the two letters together, it spells the Hebrew word ben, which is son. All scripture testifies of the son. From Genesis 1-1 to the last verse of Revelation 22 verse 21. It's just like Jesus taught. It's as if Jesus, the living word, is the watermark, the trademark of the entire Bible. So unbelievable. So amazing. So I will see you in Lesson 36. Until then, may he bless you with his shalom.